So we've been able to do the R and D and commercialize the product. So what is your advice to lifters who are currently like you know who are in the R and D phase and who want to commercialize it? What are your advice or what helped you move to that phase? Or, or if you have want to share any learnings with them? Uh, yeah, the, the biggest uh, uh, lesson learned I would say is to be agile as much as you can and to involve market research as much as you can and as early as you can. I, I went into this this trap before because I launched the website and I thought, hey, okay, this is a big gap and everyone is gonna use it. And I found, okay, people go once but they won't come back again because there's okay, they they have this sense of responsibility. Um, hi Liffers, uh, today we have a very interesting guest from all the way from Egypt and from the Lift Global 2023 cohort. So uh, we have Ahmed Osama here, the founder of Street Keep. So Ahmed Osama, welcome to the Liffy podcast. Uh, hi Suraj, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this podcast. So so can you talk about your startup Street Keep? Uh, so it, the sound seems very, very unique so we would want to know like you know what is the startup all about and, and how you're creating value thank you okay so uh, street actually is an app that socially connect uh, street users in order to share uh, good as well as bad experiences in their streets and neighborhood and these experiences um, there are some sort of, sort of social engagement between neighborhood uh, uh, residents and some of these data, especially the bad experiences uh, regarding safety incidents like uh, crashes, uh, like uh, footfalls, like harassment, threatening incidents, are go to uh, would go to our back end, and um, some sort of data analytics would be done to provide information as a service to different entities like governments, like uh, real estate companies, like retailing companies, uh, uh, and also tourists. Wow! Wow! So. So it helps you give these ratings or these scores or these votes in terms of plus and minuses and then depending on that the neighborhoods would be scored and the data would be used by these different stakeholders to get insights. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty interesting and but, but, but how did you go about solving this like you know so right out of the university you straight away found this challenge or like how did you come across this challenge and, and like how did you and when and how far was this? Okay, so actually, my my uh, uh, I did my PhD in Canada in 2018. I finished my PhD uh, uh, back then, and it was in the specialization of uh, uh, safety planning of cities, how to make cities safer. And when I returned back to Egypt, I wanted to apply what I've learned. And but actually, there is no safety database in Egypt. There are there are, there are no data points for traffic crashes, for uh, street problems like potholes and sidewalk problems, no database for harassment and threatening incidents, uh, the location, the attributes, no database. So uh, I thought, and, and, and actually without database you cannot do anything, you cannot safety plan anything. So I thought, okay, let's do a website that will crowdsource this data from people themselves, uh, since the government or the official authorities doesn't, uh, doesn't have this data. And I started this website, back then it was called Street Guards, but people would go and they won't come back because there is no sort of engagement. So they would, okay, sometimes they would locate a point, but they won't come back to this uh, website. So that's when we sort of, let's do it as an app that have like this crowdsourcing layer along with a social engagement layer. And so you said that it started with a web app and then it became a mobile app and like you know because you realized that the users were behaving in a different manner and the, the retention wasn't there maybe so what what pivots have you taken so that's a single pivot that you took and that you're able to do or you have taken multiple pivots and then um, how have you been able to do it that was actually the main pivot the, the first pivot is that okay it was like just only a crowdsourcing web uh, that uh, we take the data from uh, citizens regarding crashes, or sports, threatening incidents, potholes, and all that stuff. And then we we thought of okay, we will take this data from back end and provide it to the governance uh, or sell it to the governance if they sell it. But again, people uh, didn't like that because they want to socially engage with each other. So we add this upvote, downvote, comments, sharing. So they had this sense of community and sense of neighborhood. This is the first thing that we did in our app. The other thing is that we, were, we are now not uh, focusing on the governance or the public sector only. We are also focusing on the private sector because public sector takes time to convince them and to actually to, uh, to convince them with the idea and to convince them with with buying your data. 
So we also sort of, okay, what, because in Egypt, for example, in the local context and in many countries, there is this uh, gated communities and the small communities that are managed by real estate companies. And these real estate companies, a lot of people, so we did a, like a market research on around 7 million Egyptian on Facebook group that are actually complaining about their problems in these gated communities and neighborhoods. And there is no quantitative way of assessing these issues and solving them. So we are now also targeting uh, real estate uh, uh, companies because they would be interested in managing their related communities. Also, we added another, uh, and we are now working on a prototype of, um, of uh, our safer route module. And this module is like, it's like Google Maps. You know, Google Maps now has this uh, in, uh, um, uh, low emission routes. We are now trying mm. to introduce these higher safety routes so that when you are taking your car or if you are walking, you are trying to avoid these hot spots of, uh, of traffic crashes or hot spots of potholes or hot spots uh, of harassment and vandalism and all that stuff. So, uh, so we are now, we are uh, not only targeting public sector, but also private sector like real estate, like the right union companies. I, as well as the NGOs, because many NGOs would like to work on this uh, safety issue in, the, in developing countries and they don't have access to data. So having this data would allow them to plan well their campaigns and plan well their studies. Wow, that's a very interesting use case and I think it can have multiple, uh, these data points can create multiple values for multiple stakeholders. So it sounds so um, really nice and I think I can see it evolve because I can still like, you know, um, relate to it with my feeling when I'm traveling internationally, when we have these kind of challenges and then, like, you know, we stick up to a broader space or like, you know, we have certain things uh, marked because of the language challenges and things like that. But I think it can totally help out, that's what I can see. Now, what I wanted also your thought is that you said that you did your education in Canada, then you came back and did your R&D and then you launched the app and then now we are evolving it. You're selling it to a certain X segment of customers that you earlier thought of, but then it evolved to another segment of customers. So you've been able to do the R&D and commercialize the product. So what is your advice to lifers who are currently, like, you know, who are in the R&D phase and want to commercialize it? What are your advice or what helped you move to that phase? Or, or if you have, want to share any learnings in there? Uh, yeah, the, the biggest uh, uh, lesson learned, I would say, is to be agile as much as you can and, and to involve market research as much as you can and as early as you can. I, I went into this this trap before because I launched the website and I thought, okay, this is a big gap and everyone is going to use it. And I found, okay, people will go once, but they won't come back again because there is... Okay, they, they have this sense of responsibility, but... They, they would get uh, bored for a while. So don't spend that time. And, and after actually also this website, I, I made a prototype of the app. The first prototype was, was really also boring, I would say. So, so try to introduce market research at each and every step. And by market, market research, I mean, and this is something I need to do uh, again after, after the launch of the app, we are planning to do it again. You need to go into the street, uh, you, uh, but don't ask your friend, don't ask your family. You need to go to the street and ask the people, okay, here is an app, here is a future, will you use it, what will make you use it, and so and so. This is for the user side. Also for the uh, customer side, you need to go yourself or one of your team to, to the customers, the potential customers. Uh, like I went, for example, to Uber and they told me, we are not interested. And I thought, okay, yeah, they may not be interested because they are really well established and they don't need me. So uh, this, this new app or new feature, I need to go to a smaller companies like InDrive and DD, right heading companies. They may be more interested because they want to, to grow. So you need to, 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 uh, to go into the user, to, to the users, you need to go to the customers, the real, for me, for the real estate companies, to the right heading companies to see what they, what they really want uh, so that I, we don't spend time developing something that nobody going to use after all. Oh, wow, wow. So I think that makes sense in context of how 
like you know, your product could be a, a different kind of a value proposition or an added differentiation for the smaller companies like you know for their customer sets uh, so that could position themselves as different or more safer yeah uh, I, i think that's a very interesting point yeah. and in uh, recently you've been like you know, last year you came out of lift global so how was your experience uh, being a part of lift uh, uh, like you know uh, being a lifter um, with this with the like you know the online classes and the residential so what was your favorite part or what are your takeaways from there it was a it was a really interesting experience um i think lift was the first a real incubator i would input and it defined a lot of uh, of age thing in, in in my mind so uh, like what is business modeling what what does um uh, mark real marketing mean pitching which there is a big focus on it in the lift i would say uh, and and also mainly um, networking with high quality mentors uh, and showing them your business model and showing them your pitch and showing them your project and how it can evolve i would tell you my project was, was totally something else before left even even the logo even the the the, the design of the page and all the those small details are, are were um, were really developed after after the lift book so it helped me a lot with uh, with knowing the basics of entrepreneurship business modeling marketing pitching i would say is uh, yeah it, it had a, a very good impact you know. and if you could give some advice for the future lifters of lift global like you know so if they could be certain more prepared on certain aspects that you felt that you missed out maybe so what is the thing that you would say like you know if you do this as well then you could take have more takeaways from the lift global program uh, during the lift program uh, yeah, there are modules like business modeling module marketing module and all that stuff and for each module there is like uh, tasks i would say to try to uh, do the tasks Uh, as well as you can and as early as you can uh, because all of us mm-hmm. get busy especially that okay you are developing now a startup or something usually most of us are doing something on the side so usually uh, we, we get busy so we would i mean uh, maybe not do the task very well but these tasks are not the, are, are there for a reason actually they would provide you with, with uh, a real world experience so i remember this task of uh, that you need to go to the customer and they determine the specific number of customers and you need to go to them and talk to them and so on so on so on. actually this 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 sort of uh, of tasks are really important because they give you a mindset how how real customers work Uh, because most of us go into uh, the program with the mentality that we know everything and we know what the industry needs and the user needs, and, and but, but that's not the case. So you need to do the task well and as early as you can. That would be very helpful for your project. Yeah. Perfect, amazing. So I think that's a very interesting perspective of like you know whatever assignments are given, do it because it's given with a purpose, or like you know and be more prepared or, or maybe allocate or prioritize what what you're given as task. Sort of. Yeah. incredible now i also wanted to touch base in context to you know that the the lift alumni network is over a thousand lifters spread across 17 countries um, and and there's a lot of collaborations that we can do because we are into a lot of different segments and spread across geographies um, and yours being a uk which has got global implication in times to come uh, so what are your thoughts in context of like you know collaborations uh, with lifters are you looking at co selling co partnering co building or in the future licensing your solutions or or what do you see like you know the growth of your company in context to lift alumni or collaboration uh okay so the, yeah you are right there is an extensive network of uh, of, of lift alumni and actually you would be uh, astonished for the the, the, the experiences that the people have, uh, have there and i would say that uh, for, for me for example i i can benefit much from this uh, for this network because i'm actually uh, looking into uh, well establishing my app in the local context and then going uh, and scaling up uh, in the african and middle eastern uh, scale So, for example, in our cohort, there were like uh, lifters from Jordan. Uh, so, so there, there are different countries. You can, we can either collaborate, or at least it can help you with a network that they have in those countries. 
Each of them know a lot of people that may help you uh, either with their technical experience or even making you actually penetrate this new market that you don't know well about it and you don't know, uh, you don't have a good experience about it. So uh, yeah, I believe Lift Network would be very um, uh, important in that sense. This is one thing. And the other thing is uh, technical expertise. You may need to, uh, maybe there is a similar app or maybe there is a, an app that have uh, something common with your app and you can guys merge uh, in some sort of another. I, I saw uh, I saw one or two things like that happening in, in Live before. So this is also another thing that can be very good uh, regarding the Lyft network. Oh, so that's a very interesting uh, perspective of synergizing and then integrating together and then co-sharing data or like you know that's working on that part so you could maybe bring them to Egypt with your as an add-on with your product or your product could be an add-on to their product in that country like you know if you're uh, like, you know, serving the same uh, aspect or working on maps because that I think one thing that common is maps in, in those cases. And, and, and let me tell you another thing. I, uh, I didn't know that there's something similar to my app in like in other countries, but one of the lifters, for example, told me, no, you know what, I, there is one app, I, I don't remember if it was a lifter or a mentor, but you know what, there is an app that is in Thailand that has been doing something like that and was and succeeded in collaborating with the governance. So maybe you need to check his uh, experience. And there is an app also in somewhere else that has some some commonality with you. In this aspect, you may need to check his experience also. So so these sharing experiences are, are really interesting. Yeah. No, so I think that gives you also an understanding for the competitor analysis also, right? Competitor market research. I think that also helps yes. you with the features and I think with both as well. I think awesome. So, yep. so coming to the uh, the part where we're gonna have a like, little bit offbeat question is like you know uh, that we ask all the guests in the podcast is like you know if you had one superpower uh, like you know what would that superpower be and why? Uh, I guess this is a common uh, superpower that people may <laughs> may want to uh, to have, which is reading people's minds. Maybe <laughs> especially yeah. in the, I, I think this would be very helpful in the startup uh, <laughs> startup field. You need to know what people think, especially users, and uh, yeah. because in, in many times people, uh, and this is one of the importances of uh, market free market research and rigorous market research. They may just be kind because they don't want to uh, tell you, okay, no, I, I'm, I'm not going to use that. But they would tell you, oh, yeah, it's good and so on, so on, so on. So, yeah, that, and, and that's what rigorous market research would actually uh, would, would, would show. So I think reading their minds and, and really knowing their opinion and what they want, I think this is something that I would like to have, yeah. Wow, that's a, that's a cool features like Professor X, I think, from X-Men. So uh, one more insight or one more aspect that we wanted to have conversation or like, you know, have your thoughts is that as we said, as we spoke about that, you know, LIF is this huge network of uh, like, you know, LIFers, innovators across so many countries, uh, like, you know, so many different cultures and so many aspects. Uh, and after the residential, we have this time of example, the gap comes in and then like, you know, we have this uh, stuff happening and, and the academy dies, it tries its own things to have activities. But, but what is what is your thought in the aspect of what kind of activities we could have in LIF as an alumni, like in the global alumni or the country alumni, or like, you know, what activities we could have so that the engagement and the networking that you said, so the knowledge sharing that happened, uh, like, you know, that could keep on happening and the dots can be created so that as we grow, the right moment comes, we have friends or peers whom we can rely on. So what kind of activities do you think would be interesting for us? That, that's, that's a very good point. After LIF, although we had a very good connection uh, during the residency and during the program, but I think we need uh, like a regular uh, first regular in-country meetings with a same cohort, maybe like it's monthly or something. And actually one of our mentors, Jim, actually uh, recommended us to do that. But it needs to be, it, need, it, it needs some pushing and needs some like uh, follow up and all that stuff. And along with the in-country gathering and in-country meeting, and does it, it doesn't have to be people of the same board only, maybe also the previous lefers, that, that would be very interesting. 
in parallel to that also a regular global i mean uh, uh, lift uh, gatherings of course it's hard to make people they fly from country to another even if it is online and if it is like uh, for specific topics that would be great lift is doing something like that it's doing these trainings like uh, there are some trainings that are provided and you can meet uh, people from like previous court so that's good yeah and, and we need it to be more regular uh, in order to keep this this link yeah okay so i think uh, more conversations and more like you know more talks and more sessions on a, on a, on a national and on a global level that's what we're trying to share the perfect agri perspective yeah. um, i think perfect and and i think uh, we uh, like you know that that's like, you know thank you for so much for your time in context of sharing what you're doing uh, in 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 egypt and like you know in in your segment which is very unique and we spoke about your product and how you've done the journey from sharing your product to customers which were earlier dormant and then moving on to different different like you know use cases and uh, it's a very interesting to also see that you've been able to do the r&d and successfully able to commercialize and then you know, i'm sure it's going to go bounce in terms of the scale because you have the nudge of working with the users and you've got the understanding of it so i think so all the best from the podcast uh, and from me and from the alumni and we look forward to like you know talking together and connecting and meeting soon and and best wishes to you and thank you for being on the podcast thank you thank you suraj for your time and for inviting me and i hope that we have shared something beneficial to the different potential thank you